Thank you, David. <laughs> I was warned to give you all a little time to find your seats. <laughs> you remember that was uh, the, the song uh, toward the end of the movie, The Birdcage. They all walked out the door, so thank you for not. <laughs> that was fun, David. Thank you. Yeah. So one thing we all have in common is we'd like a better world. We'd like the world to get better. We'd like our world to get better. But not just our world, we'd like the whole world to get better. Is there anyone that would disagree with that? Pretty logical, right? What we don't often talk about is how the world is getting better. And that's what I want to share with you today. Now, you will know from, uh, from all the time that you've spent listening to Barbara and listening to me that we have different styles. We were given nicknames a few years back. They called her the rock star. <laughs> and they called me the professor. And I'm going to live up to that today because I'm going to show you a lot of graphs. <laughs> and although on the surface they may not seem very exciting, they have an interesting story to share with us. So as we go through these different things, please try to stay as awake as you can because you don't want to miss any of this. It's really hot stuff, and it's important for us to know. And we'll talk more about why that is at the end. But here's where we're going to start. We're going to start with the idea of life expectancy on planet Earth. How, how long do we get to stay here? So here's, here's what we're finding out from that. Here's your graph uh, through 2015, starting in 1770, about the time that our country was founded, through the current time, and although I don't expect you to be able to read all those lines, you will see that they're all going upward, that life expectancy is, is increasing over time. In, 19, in 1800, no country in the world had a life expectancy above 40. By 1950, it had grown to around 60 in Europe and in the Americas, leaving Africa and Asia far behind. What comes to mind with that particular uh, line of thinking at 1800 was, was the idea that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams both lived to be 90 in a time when the average age was 40. Isn't that interesting? Uh, more information. Since then, life expectancy in Asia has increased twice as fast as Europe, and in Africa, one and a half times half times faster than Europe. So the entire of humanity is, is catching up on this idea that we get to live longer lives. The, the bottom line here is, is that no matter how old you are today, you're estimated to live longer than anyone your age in the history of humankind. Pretty cool, huh? So don't underestimate this idea that life expectancy falls into a lot of categories. Uh, one is being happy to be here or you leave, right? So those of us that are planning on sticking around for a while, this is really good news. You would agree? Yeah. Good. Let's go on to our next look, and that's disease eradication. I think I showed this to you one time before, but it's, that, it's so impressive that researchers, scientists, uh, medical experts have found ways to save quite a few lives. Look at that, chlorination of water, 177 mil million people because most of the people in the world were drinking dirty water that was killing them. That's not the case anymore. Smallpox, measles, the, the creation of penicillin as a way to deal with uh, antibodies and to, to uh, get the bacteria out of our bodies, oral rehydration therapy, otherwise known as Gatorade which it truly is a lifesaver, and the reason that it was able to save 54 million lives is that people with diarrhea would die of dehydration. So mixing the proper amounts of sugar and salt resolved that until the diarrhea went away instead of killing people. Diphtheria, tetanus, and whooping cough, all handled, saving over a half billion people. That's incredible. That's astonishing. We live in a time when these things are, are not our issues anymore. Well, there's something about smallpox going on right now, but they're working it out, I'm sure. Okay, that's disease eradication. World population that is undernourished. 
You know how when you were a kid, your mother always told you to eat your food because peop people were starving in China? Um, a lot of other places too. And it was a reality when many of us were young that that was the case. But look how the numbers are working now. Again, don't uh, the world line is this one right here. That's, that's the world line. It's just under 20%, and it has dropped to almost 10%. That's significant. But looking at, at what some parts of the world we're dealing with, everybody seems to be doing better. Everybody, maybe that last line, Middle East, is about, is about neutral, but everybody else in the, on, the, on the planet seems to be, and that was the lowest line anyway, so it shouldn't matter. But this is a real look at the fact that people are getting sustainable uh, nourishment into their lives now, which for many was not the case. And there's obviously still work to do. We're not all without that. But it's getting better. It's absolutely getting better. That's nutrition. Famine. We've all heard of famines around the world, places where there, there wasn't any rain and the crops wouldn't grow and people were dying. We have found ways to not have that happen. We haven't always found ways to create more rain, but we have found ways to make sure that when there is a famine about to happen in the world, that there are tools and methods and, and organizations that are dedicated to making sure that those people don't die from not getting any food. That's a really big deal. See where, it, it, where the line ends in 2015? It's a flat zero. People don't die of famine anymore. Now, to say that'll never happen again is, is a little uh, uh, over, of an overstatement. It could happen again, but we seem to have the mechanism now to avoid that. That makes a better world. Yeah. Yeah. To know that our fe fellow men and women on this planet aren't facing that, that destruction because of the food flow. Everybody gets to eat now. That's a brilliant thing. Let's talk about income. Not my favorite graph, but it does kind of make the point that through most of time, there wasn't any gross world income. That probably there wasn't ways to count it. There, wasn't, uh, uh, there weren't monetary systems and such. But once you get into the 1800s all the way to current day, you can see how it skyrocketed up, and that number is well above 100 trillion US dollars that the world creates every year. Now, you understand that doesn't mean there's $100 trillion of currency in the world, but it means that every time somebody does work in exchange for money, that gets counted here as best it can be counted by the World Bank. And what it's saying is, is that we are a world filled with people that are exchanging their talents and abilities for money better than we ever have been. And yes, there's a great disparity on the money that certain people make, but it seems that more and more people are making money in the world, and that's a good thing. And this is about absolute poverty, the other side of that wealth. And this is a truly fascinating uh, a depiction of it. There are three, three lines on this graph. Uh, they are simply that, they, that, that different instruments use different amounts of money to reflect abs ab absolute poverty. Uh, the, the upper one is uh, $2 per day. The lower line, the bit long line, is, is a dollar per day. And then it was th these two instruments were replaced later by one that actually measured at $1.90 a day, being uh, from the World Bank saying that if, if a person anywhere in the world ha makes less than $1.90 a day, they live in abject poverty. One might say that it's a very higher standard in this country, but you know, worldwide, that's what is used. And as you can see, way back in the 1820s, th the numbers were in the 80s and 90s as to how many people lived in that impoverished level of existence. And today, just under 10%. Just under 10% of the world lives in abject poverty. Still, we're not done, but you cannot argue that things are getting better. Things are getting better. And I believe that's where my... Oh, and, and I don't have the, the, uh, a graph to show the United States, but I will point out that poverty, even in the United States, has diminished every year for the last five years. We're definitely on a roll here. Yeah. Not right now, thank you. Thank you. It messes with my train of thought. Okay. 
So now, I'm, what, we're gonna, what I'm going to be giving you now are U.S. numbers because a lot of this information is not available uh, uh, from other countries around the world, from other governments. But our government is big into statistics, so I got quite a few here on the United States that I want to share with you. Median household income. Two very different lines. Uh, the upper line is adjusted for inflation. The lower line is actual dollars as they were, as they were available at the, their value at that time. This graph starts in 2000, ends in 2016, and you can see the dollars have steadily gone up as a median place, the middle place, for people to be making income in this country. The other one has, they both have a dip. You can see uh, they f th that that follows right after the, uh, uh, the recessions that have happened in this, uh, the beginning of the 21st century. But the fact is, is that there, there tends to be this upward trend of people making more money. Now, one interesting thing to point out about this is, when you start adjusting for inflation, not everybody adjusts to inflation the same way because not everybody buys a house, not everybody buys a car, and all of those figures are added into this inflationary rate. So many people are, are, don't have the same inflationary rate that the government reports. So that makes for an even greater sense of, in, of increase in, in the income that people are having in this country. So I believe I can say that we're doing better financially. This is our energy consumption. No surprise that it's going up. There's more of us. We're consuming more uh, consumable uh, sources of energy. Uh, and these are the, the main ones, and I think there's a, a great story in this. Obviously, we're still driven by petroleum, and we probably will be for a time yet, but you can see the changes. Just for fun, how many people in this room own an electric car or a hybrid car? Boy, I got a quarter right down the middle here and some folks over here. That's going to change these numbers over time. Not completely, but they're going to have an impact on them, the more of us that, uh, uh, that decide to drive electric cars. I've got my eye on a Tesla one of these days. <laughs> so petroleum's at the top. The next one's natural gas. Did you know the United States has the largest reserves of national, or natural gas in the world? We do. And it burns cleanly so that it doesn't have the impacts impact on the environment that petroleum in general does. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. You can see where coal has leveled off. And I think over the next few years, you'll probably see a reduction in coal simply because there are, uh, there are other ways that are coming. And that's the line right below there. As you can see, the renewables, which means wind, air, uh, water, anything, any way of, of creating uh, uh, solar. Thank you. That was what I was looking for. Uh, uh, are ways that we that will continue to increase, and as it does, chances are the coal will, will settle lower. Um, so that's obviously for the environment very good, and nuclear is kind of the, the least used, uh, and it's pretty flat. So take this information and look at this next slide with me. Air pollution. Now, I can't tell you that I know what all of these, uh, these lines represent completely, but this is, these are numbers that say in the United States that we are having drastic reductions in our amount of solids. And those are the, the, the graphs uh, scale on the, right the left-hand side there is parts per million in the atmosphere measured. You can see uh, the top one is ammonia. It's a short line across there. Obviously, whatever is producing ammonia is, is sitting right there. It hasn't really moved. But everything else is now in a downward movement. So the air is getting cleaner. Yay. It's getting cleaner. <laughs> you can say thank you with every breath you take for that. Let's go into crime. Violent crime rates in the United States from 1990 to 2016. There are less violent crimes in the United States. Now, what, what I believe is that there are less violent crimes in the world. I don't know that the world would show this level of dip or, or down uh, movement on that. But the fact is, is that we as a species, even though we hear all that's going on, even though all of these things that we hear about on the news are bad, the truth is, is that as a species, we're getting more peaceful. We're getting more able to live together on this planet, which is incredibly important to our survival. Doesn't mean that it's all handled, 
but it's getting better. That's down to, uh, let me see, this is reported violent crime rate per 100,000, and it's down below 400 per 100,000. That's really remarkable. When, we, when, when many of us were kids, that was not even considered a possibility. And yet, there it is. There it is. Hate crimes. I tell you, my heart was broken with what happened this week in New Zealand. That is the most peaceful, peace-loving country I know. And that someone would do that to people. I'm sure that's why it was such a, a, a terrible situation was no one would have expected it there. You expect it in other cities where, you know, people are climbing the walls with all their upset and everything. But Christchurch isn't that kind of place. I've been to Christchurch. It's not like that. So this helps me understand that, that that's an anomaly. We're not moving in that direction. We're actually moving to less and less hate crimes in, in our country. And it's true in the world as well. We are finding our way. And this is a really important thing to see and to understand that things are getting better with the way that we treat one another. Domestic violent rate. You know, most, most violence happens in families. It happens in homes. It happens between people that know each other. That's the vast majority of crime. In this case, we're talking about domestic abuse. That top, top uh, line on the graph represents all and any domestic abuse in the United States from 2005 to 2016. You can see a very clear downward trend. In fact, all of them have a downward trend. The others, I include partner abuse, non-sexual, family abuse, non-sexual, and interestingly, this gray line right here represents uh, any sexual assault, including any attempts. You see that that might, at one time, let's see, in 2015, had a bit of an uptick, might again, and that would be uh, simply a change in reporting. That, that more people are reporting when they are experiencing a, a, a domestic violent experience. So we're getting more, more open about that, more willing to talk about that. And I believe we're healing it. Okay. There's two graphs here to talk about, and this is education, and we've gone back to the world here. So there's one line on here, the only one that actually starts on the left-hand column, that is the, uh, the global average and it runs through here. So the estimate was, not that we had numbers, but the estimate is, uh, is that there were about 17% of people in the world in the, in the 1820s had any formal education. That doesn't mean they were graduates, it doesn't mean they had master's degrees or anything of the sort, but they had some time in their life where they sat down with a teacher and they learned in a, in a formal public way. Started at, it's, um, it's, it's estimated, whoops, I want to do that. We want to go, we want to start here at 17, and you can see right now in, in uh, 2015, it's measured at 86%. 86% of people in the world now have some level of formal education. That's extraordinary. That's wonderful. And it goes right along with the literacy rates, people that can read in their own tongue, of course, but that started at, uh, in 1820 at, at an estimate of 12% and has ended up, can you read that? 83% of the people in the world can read. Isn't that remarkable? And these are numbers that come from prestigious organizations that do this that want to know the truth. So we're not looking at skewed numbers here. These are real numbers. I know, isn't that a mess? But the beauty of this is it tells a story about what happens in your home. So we've, I want to begin with the left-hand column that says hours of housework per week, and it goes from zero to 70 hours. As you can see, in something around the turn of the century in 1900, it was about 60 hours a week that the average domestic time it took to keep a household. Now... This brings into people that live alone, but it also brings into people with six or 12 kids. So, you know, this is the average of, of households back in the 1900s. But as you can see, that has steadily gone down to where it's about 25 hours a week to maintain an average household now. 
to do all the cooking and chopping and cleaning and everything else that it takes to maintain a home. I figure Barbara and I spend about 25 hours cleaning up after ourselves. But that's way better than what my, my mom or my, my grandmother had to do or, or anybody else in the past. So that's improving. Now, while that's going on, we go to the right-hand side and see that we're looking at a percentage of households that have these things. So look at what they are. Back in, back in 1890, running water was about 12, 13% of people had running water. Now it's 100%. Same is true for electricity, but those numbers don't come in until after the turn of the century, but they go right up to 100% to where virtually every household has electricity. I know there are uh, uh, people in this room that live off the grid, but Charlie, you still have, have electricity in your house, even though you're not hooked up to the grid. So everybody's got electricity, and then you see these appliances, microwave, washing machine, dishwasher, and stove, and how they're all moving up very dramatically over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Life's getting better. We get to do something other than that. So what do we do when, when, uh, when all this stuff is handled? We move on to necessities versus luxuries. So look at this thing. Over between 1984 and about 20, 2012, this is the, the, the direction that our expenditures, our money goes toward the things that we have to pay for, our rent, our transportation, our insurance, our food, our clothes. Those necessities of life are going down. We're spending less money on those things. And we're spending more money, percentage-wise, on fun things, Yay. things that we want to do, traveling, uh, uh, exploring different things in life, taking classes, doing fun stuff, going out to eat, all those fun things is taking more of our, of our uh, money and energy than it has ever in the past. Another indication that maybe things are getting better, right? Happiness. You know we were going to talk about happiness, right? because we always talk about happiness. This is not a timeline saying that, that as, over time everybody is getting happier, but I think it's still relevant. Because what you see there is that this ranges between 6.2 and 7.0 on a 10-point scale of happiness. This is averaging everybody together. So this isn't about individuals, it's about a collective, and it's about people our age. So think about how old you are, people your age, are on that line wherever you see it, across the bottom. And here's another piece of it, of course. This means that the older you get, the more likely you're going to be happy. Yay. Not a bad thing, huh? <laughs> Might indicate things are getting better. <laughs> well, apparently, if you're not alive, you weren't very happy. <laughs> I'm extrapolating that from the numbers here. So what do you think? Are you getting the idea that maybe the world is getting better? Yes. Why is this important? It's important because we need what's called a mental equivalent for life. We need to count on it. We need to call on it from within us. And the only way we can know that this is true is by looking at the numbers and hearing the truth, that life is getting better. The human beings are becoming more functional on planet Earth that people are becoming more generous, more powerful in, in and of themselves, not over anyone. People are becoming more prosperous. People are having better lives. The environment is improving. I could have spent a whole other section on that. There's all kind of ways that we are living better lives. But because we deal with it incrementally day by day by day, we don't get a sense of it. We don't realize how much better things are getting. But when you slip back into the past, like you watch uh, Bohemian Rhapsody and seeing the great uh, Freddie Mercury talking on, on payphones. <laughs> Who's talked on a payphone in the, in the last week? <laughs> Nobody. Last, I could say last year, and I probably would get a couple hands because there are a couple of them still out there. But for the most part, that's not how we do it anymore. We've improved our way of, of communicating and being on the planet. In so many ways, this life is better than it was. So it's our job as religious scientists, as students of the science of mind, to not fall into the abyss that things are getting worse. 
Now, is everything getting better to our standards? Of course not. But all in all, this thing about being human on planet Earth is improving. And that's for us to know. Not only is it improving for us as human beings on planet Earth, but this planet is doing better. And I know we're hearing about global warming is creating all of these things that happen. Global warming was blamed on the tornadoes and the hurricane and the earthquakes and the fires. I don't know. I'm not going to tell you one way or the other. I don't have any authority to speak to that. What I can tell you, though, is even after these kind of calamitous things, the earth heals itself. It takes care of itself. We have to clean up after ourselves, but the earth does fine. The fires in California, for example, burned great, massive, tens of thousands of acres of land in California, decimated it, cleared it out. And this is what it looks like now. And it looks like this. Yeah, these are, these are fresh pictures out of the LA Times. California's in bloom. And it did that after this, these fires. Now, does that mean we want fires and we want to, to encourage them? Of course not. We don't want people losing property. We don't want uh, to have to go through all of that to, to save people and save property. We want, we want life to be beautiful and wonderful all the time. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes things happen we would prefer not to. But this is a clear demonstration of how nature deals with it and how we as spiritual beings on planet Earth, can also deal with our lives. When we go through a crisis, we recover. In fact, we make it even better because that's who we are. That's what we've come to do. That's who we've come to be. So on this last Sunday in the winter of 2019, we have much to look forward to, that life continues to get better and better and it's our job always to remember that every single day and to give thanks for it. When we do, as the song says, our lives will get better and there will be more good in who we are and how we live. And that's the truth. God bless you. I love you. Yay. I'll take news from you any day. All right. So who is here for the very first time? Came to Center for Spiritual Living Asheville. We have three people on the back row. What are your names? Ellie Olsa, Alyssa, and Marielle. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Center for Spiritual Living Asheville. Who else is here for the first time? All the way in the back. What's your name? Welcome, Suzanne. I'm so glad that you're here. And who's, who's hiding behind Susan? What's your name? Charlie, welcome, Charlie. I'm so glad that you're here. Now you have a choice. You can fill out that blue card or you can text CSLA to 345-345. And if you text that, you will go on our email list and you'll be able to find out all kinds of great things that are going on at the center. So you could even do both to make sure you get all the good news that's going on here. Fill out your blue card, text this, and know that you are very welcome here. For me personally, my life totally transformed when I walked into a Science of Mind Center, and there has been no looking back. Just better and better and better. I'm so glad that you're here. I think this is the best center in the world. I think this is the best part of the country, and I think we are the best people ever, period, end of story. I'm so glad that you came. <sighs> so I want to give you a little statistics as our prosperity acceptors come forward. We are changing the world. And we have our website statistics from February. I want you to know that almost 11,000 people have visited our YouTube channel or our website in February. And February was a short, cold month. They've been to our um, Sunday celebrations, our events, and our classes. And I want you to know that the top countries that watch our website after the United States, the first one is China. Welcome, Chinese people. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know nothing in Chinese. <laughs> but when we say the world is getting better, we are playing our part. So we've got China, and this month we've got Canada as third runner-up. Usually we have China, India, Bulgaria, and France. We're covering the world, and we are diligently working on our Spanish translations to open up South America to these teachings. Yes. It is uh, St. Patrick's Day. Being a true blue Irish-born girl, I just want to give you a little blessing for St. Patrick's Day. May your troubles be less, your blessings be more, and nothing but happiness come through your door. Yeah. Yeah. And what I like to do is take whatever I'm giving and hold it in my hand. I know some of you give on our auto giving program. Some of you do PayPal religiously. Thank you, God bless you. Some of you have your banks send in your checks and some of you put money in the baskets. And I want you to know that I'm very grateful for that, that we truly do use these funds to do good in the world. We've got people watching us from all over. We've got people reading books. We've got people listening to the practitioner's treatments over and over and over again. And we are spreading this teaching that the world is getting better because of the power and the presence within us all around the world. So thank you. thank you for what you're giving. And what I know is that God is the source of all supply, that money is the action of God in our lives. And as we give this gift, it lifts us. It shines our light into the world. It touches and blesses our lives and every place that it goes. I know that each one of us comes together to make this Center for Spiritual Living Asheville all that it was ever meant to be. It is a place of peace, a beacon of light, a tower of strength, and a fountain of wisdom that touches the lives of all who call it home. And we'll repeat our investment affirmation together aloud, I freely and joyously give from the abundance of my, over of my overflowing wealth knowing my gift goes with love as it touches and blesses the world. And so it is. <laughs>